It is a form of tough love, this critique of the industry, but I think it's important to remind people that, for example, when David Olushoga was speaking at the McTaggart lecture saying that he was going to speak the truth and see if, if he still had a career afterwards. When John Boyega spoke during the Black Lives Matter protests, he said, Look, I might not have a career after this, but I'm going mm -hmm. to speak anyway. And I think sometimes people don't realize the, real, the reality in that risk, that in speaking, you, you never know whether your career might be prematurely ended as a result. For sure. And it's definitely harmed my career. Definitely. I mean, it's financially harmed me and that's fine. That's something that I just take on the chin because I would rather that than make money off of, you know, the insecurities of young girls around the world. But I, it's uh, like, for example, I, you know, things that I've done that haven't been public where I've had to take the HR route to get someone racist or misogynist, like taken down from within a big institution has denied me the opportunity to then have my own show has been taken away from that network because I'm considered difficult or trouble for calling out the truth when I see it. We just saw that happen to Gabrielle Union over the United States. So it definitely is something that is a risky thing to do. But again, like, if not me, then who? You know, because I don't see a lot of my peers being willing to, to, and this isn't me like necessarily bigging myself up, but I'm not seeing enough of the energy that we saw for a minute in Me Too continue amongst, like, amongst my peers. And we all have a responsibility to not just take the check and then do nothing powerful and good with it. It's such a, we're such a kind of, we, we still exist in so much fear of losing our careers and yet not fear of the negative impact we're having on young people. And so I think that, you know, I hope that we will see, especially after this year where more and more people have been, you know, somewhat forced to finally speak out and take a side mm -hmm. and pick a side. Uh, I'm hoping that we will see people be more vocal about social political issues who have the power that I have or more power and money than I have. But we have to take these risks because without them, there will be no change. And so I'm so proud of David and John and, and I'm proud of myself for just being able to withstand the fear mongering and carry on. Cause I think we, I think the reason that we're going to survive is because we are on the right side of history and we, it, this comes from a good place within that isn't motivated by greed. There are very few people who I feel I could ask this question with so little inkling of what might happen, what they might say. But what, <laughs> what is next for you, Jamila? What is your, what are on your horizons and uh, what, what are your next moves? Oh God, I don't know. Um, it can't be porn. It's not going to be porn because I just don't have the upper body strength. Uh, <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, writing, I'm writing a book. I'm writing my first ever book. Uh, it's not an autobiography fully because I'm young, um, but <laughs> I'm writing a book about the things that I have learned uh, for better or worse. And I am working on a documentary series. I'm building my own company. It's called iWay, where we are an allyship platform for young people. You know, if ever there was a year, it's this year where people are realizing that, oh my God, we're so ignorant and helpless and complicit and complacent. And so we need to learn about other communities, but people don't know where to start. And this is a very unwelcoming environment currently that we're in, where if you don't present yourself as knowing all of the answers about every single experience around the world, you are bashed and mocked and ridiculed and piled onto. So what I did was I created a safe space on the internet. It's called iWeigh, I-W-E-I-G-H. And it's on Instagram, it's on Twitter. We have our own website, a YouTube channel and a podcast. It's an education platform where I learn about other marginalized groups and experiences and you get to learn with me. Because I have never professed to be some great intellectual. I left school at 16 years old. I'm learning on the job and I am not ashamed of that. I do not expect myself to know all of the answers. I expect myself to try and learn every single day. So we're, bu we're building that into a production company. I'm starting to give other activists their own shows where I'm no longer involved. I'm just producing them. And we're trying to build a radically inclusive space of media where you will be able to learn in a way that makes you feel safe and excited to learn rather than shamed into doing so. Do you see this as your next phase of disrupting the industry status quo? So as well as just being present and your, the message that you have starting to actually create content and have executive power, is that something that you think is important given your mission? Yeah, and I self-fund the entire company so that I don't have to answer to a man ever again in my career. Uh, I want to be the person who is 
pulling all of the strings and I want to have complete power to hire whoever I want, to give people the opportunity, to give them a chance to have experience, to build up to executive levels. Uh, I, I'm, I'm building a diverse team on and off screen. And I, you know, Ava DuVernay said these words that meant so much to me where she was just like, stop fighting for a seat at the table, just build your own table. And so I, as well, will be trying to build my own table. <laughs> this is what building one's own table looks like. So yeah. that is something that everyone watching, I think, will be able to take inspiration from. As a, as, and you're, 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 you're always honest about the ways in which you're learning as you go along, which I think is rare. There are so many disincentives to be honest about making mistakes and you can't succeed if you're not allowed to fail. But it's so funny because when a man makes a massive mistake and some like, like an egregious massive mistake, then he will come back and do an interview in GQ and be like, I was drinking too much and I went to rehab and I've come back and I'm changed. And men and women are like, oh my God, what a hero for owning up to it. A woman makes a single mistake or wears the wrong thing or makes the wrong Oscar speech. And it's like, that bitch is evil. She is manipulative. She has to be gotten rid of. She's a danger to society. It's so funny how few second chances we give to women and yet we just give so many to men I mean obviously this stands outside of like if a man has actually committed like a felony assault against someone then maybe they get counseled for a while but generally it is there is such a difference like you go back and you look through every woman that you've just been like I don't like her I don't know why but I just something about her I don't like her it's like if you actually investigate that go back and look through the media and you look at the way that she's been spoken about or the ways that her interviews are reported. It's like, we are all poisoned against women. And I love the fact that I have social media because I'm able to actually represent myself. I love that I have my own podcast that I produce myself uh, with a wonderful team of women. Um, I love the fact that I have the chance to set the record straight on my own terms, in my own words. And, you know, I get taken out of context all the time. And it's always women journalists, which breaks my heart, where they set me up with false headlines and uh and they twist all of my words to make me look stupider than I am or more careless than I am and that is a sign of a patriarchy soaked industry that at the end of the day even if the woman is an editor she is answering to a man at the top of that publication we need more female-owned publications and outlets I mean, the person who introduced me to the concept of a double agent for the patriarchy, is that what's going on? Or is this, uh, is this some particular sense of threat that you think that the female journalists who particularly give you this distorted coverage feel towards you? What is going on there? I don't know. I think it's both. I think, you know, we haven't really evolved over the last couple thousand years from feeling like, you know, there is safety in numbers. And so, I mean, there is safety in numbers, but, but, you know, we must like align ourselves with the majority. And so, you know, if you're in this industry, the majority is straight white men. And so if you align yourselves with them and, you know, you, you're a good girl and you go out and do the things that you're told to do and attack the right people, even if they are of your own gender. And by the way, I'm very pro women criticizing other women. I'm so open to that. I would rather be criticized by a woman than a man. I'm fine with that. I don't think it's unfeminist. But when you harm a woman or you take her out of context or you deliberately set her up to fall, then you are participating in patriarchy. You are a double agent for the patriarchy and we don't see it coming. It's a very clever thing that men send women out to do, which is so that, because they are, they don't want to say these terrible things about this woman. They don't want to attack this woman because they'll be called out for misogyny. So they send a woman out to do your dirty work. The other thing is I think, I also think sometimes women, and I say this as a former misogynist, you know, I wasn't always very careful in the way that I would talk about women's sexuality publicly eight years ago or 10 years ago. Uh, I think that we also sometimes don't understand what's happening when we see someone step out of the box that we've all been given. And I think we feel like we feel fear of the unknown and then we try to attack it. And so we all need to reconcile that all of us have some sort of internalized misogyny that we need to work through, identify and kill in order to progress. Do you feel as if in the ways that the murder of George Floyd has made people, I feel more receptive to questioning their own internalized racism, that mm -hmm. conversation about the ways in which women have internalized misogyny has, hasn't progressed as far as it needs to? A hundred percent. We definitely need to have that conversation. And I think it's really important that we don't just be like, women are just innocent victims, that we also have a part to play. And I think that that's empowering. 
I think it shows that, oh, we have some control over this dynamic. Like we have autonomy and there are certain things that we could do to build together to create a stronger wall in order to create a safer space for all of us. You know, we already have patriarchy to stand against. So why would we try and do this individually? Why don't we do this as a group? Surely that's easier and better. That's what they do. Um, and so, yes, I, I definitely think that we are behind in that conversation. And I think it's so funny that you bring up the way that the rhetoric has changed post George Floyd, because the way that you and I started to become like internet friends or comrades is because we both called out the systemic racism within our media. And we were both called racists for purely calling out the racism that is rampant in our media. And that is because we were a culture who was more afraid of being called racist than of racism itself, which now is a very normalized rhetoric. But a year ago, when you and I were sticking up for Meghan Markle, when other people weren't, uh, I, you know, I, I'm very glad to see a lot of people start to backpedal and start to register that actually, no, there is a serious problem here and we're, we're not going to get away with it anymore. We have to wrap, Jamila. I could talk to you for so much longer, but this has been real talk and it has been our safe space. So it's uh, a sign of change that on this platform, we can create a space to have these really honest conversations. Thank you for your work. And I, and I'm sure everyone watching, cannot wait to see what you create next. So keep doing it. And thank you so much for being here. And may I just say, I know that you're, you've just wrapped up, but fuck it, I can't stop myself. Um, I am one of the greatest joys of the last couple of years has been watching your rise. I respect you so much. We don't know each other, but I am so happy to have your voice out there. And as, as a woman who has always despaired when I see women try and tear each other down and think there's only space for one, I am loving the numbers I'm seeing and I'm so thrilled just to see what you continue to achieve in this industry. So I'm so flattered that you agreed to do this today. Thank you. It was a massive honor for me. And, um, and <laughs> may the sisterhood continue because we have a big fight on our hands. <laughs>